All right, so we're going to go through our final set of sensory notes for this particular video. This is going to cover our cutaneous senses, so skin and touch in general. We're going to look at olfaction, smelling, and then we're going to look at gustation, and that is taste. So, your somatic senses are what we refer to as your skin and body senses. So this is your sense of touch that is mixed with pressure, warmth, cold, and pain. So we're going to talk very much where the cutaneous senses are concerned uh, about the experience of pain in particular. Um, purely because there's a very fascinating theory we have behind why it is that we're able to experience pain. Pressure, warmth, cold, and pain are all distinct skin senses. Um, only pressure has identifiable receptors on it uh, in terms of neural signals. Um, but skin sensations are basically all just variations of pressure, warmth, cold, and pain. So you can see these visuals here that each of these um, neural fibers basically has um, combinations, so they're considered to be semi-independent sensational experiences. Now pain itself and how we go about feeling it is basically just our body's way of saying that something is wrong. It's not functioning normally. Pain is typically going to result from damage that occurs to your skin or other tissues, um, to bones, if you break a bone, for example. There is, interestingly enough, a really rare disease called CIP. It stands for chronic insensitivity to pain or congenital insensitivity to pain. Um, this is exactly as it sounds. A person that is diagnosed with CIP is incapable of experiencing pain. For them, extreme heat or cold does not factor into their sensory experiences. Um, and so actually, it's not terribly out of the ordinary for someone who has been diagnosed with CIP to die very, very young. And of things that we would typically not equate death to follow. For example, you can get the flu and die from it because your body can't tell you that something's wrong. When we don't feel well, we get achy, we get a headache, so we feel discomfort and some level of pain. For those with CIP, their body can't tell them that. It's not a trigger to them to say, hey, something is not normal in terms of your functioning. So, you know, another way of looking at it is you could die of a broken leg if your skin gets infected, if the wound that's there is infected. Your body can't tell you that there's something wrong. It won't respond to any level of pain. So it is very typical for those who are diagnosed with CIP to, to, to die fairly early on in their life. You see right here a girl, uh, an image of a girl. This is Ashley Blocker. Ashley was diagnosed with CIP and she can't feel pain. And in addition to that, she does not experience extreme heat or cold. So she could walk outside in you know, negative 20 degree temperatures with no shoes on, you know, just in shorts and a t-shirt and the extreme cold would not affect her at all. Um, she'd be able to just run around as if there was nothing going on. And much of that is because of her CIP. It just does not register for her that she should be experiencing pain or discomfort and that things aren't normal. Much of the reason why we believe pain occurs is because of essentially biological, psychological, and socio-cultural factors. Uh, and so this very much adheres to the biopsychosocial approach to psychology, which is considered to be the most um, up-to-date modern perspective of psych that we cover. So our experience of pain, biologically speaking, is the fact that the spinal cord, which we've discussed, you read in your reading guide from last unit in unit three, your ability to do, have like knee-jerk kind of reactions to pain, you know, just immediately remove your hand back from a hot burner, for example, that goes specifically to your spinal cord. Your brain does not register anything necessarily. It's instantaneously to the spinal cord, and the spinal cord is what um, establishes that jerk reaction to remove something. The brain's interpretation of that activity occurs next. So it's spinal cord, jerk reaction, then brain's interpretation of the pain. Um, there is also a possibility that you can, genetically speaking, have a difference in the production of endorphin in your brain. And um, that is very much, we know that those are the body's natural uh, painkillers. And so if you have a genetic 
uh, difference, you know, you're prone to lower levels or even high levels of endorphin production, your sensitivity to pain can be different. Um, you know, my father, you've heard me discuss his myriad number of surgeries and the amount of pain that he was in on in a daily basis. So his pain tolerance was significantly higher than for me. Um, I get a paper cut and I feel like I want to cry. So much of that can be explained by genetic factors. Psychologically speaking, we do have influences there too. The attention that you have to the pain, um, your expectation of it. If, for example, you bump your elbow, you hit your funny bone, you know, we have this mentality that, oh my gosh, if I rub it, oh, I'll feel better. Purely based on that expectation in and of itself, you will likely feel better. So there very much is a mind over matter scenario. If you expect the pain to be severe, it will be severe. And if you expect it not to, then it won't. Sociocultural factors that influence all of this, the presence of others, um, if you're around other people <clears throat> and you're in a good mood, um, it's not going to affect you. If you're you know, walking down the hall and you stub your toe, but you're with a bunch of other people, you're not going to act like it bothers you at all or you know, say that you're experiencing pain from it. Um, your ability to experience empathy for another person if they've been um, in a scenario of pain, that can factor into your own experiences of it. Um, and just the cultural expectations. We perceive that a paper cut isn't supposed to uh, be incredibly painful. And so purely because of that cultural expectation, we have a tendency to think that someone who gets upset by a paper cut is a big baby. So all of those factor into how it is that we go about experiencing pain. Now, much of what we explain um, theoretically with regard to pain is the gate control theory. For most psychologists, this is the number one defining factor, biologically speaking, for why we can experience pain. Uh, and essentially what happens where this is concerned is two theorists, Melzack and Wall, came out at various different points in their psychological professional career. And they propose that we have a gate in our spinal cord that controls our experience of pain, whether it is to block it or to send that signal on to our peripheral nervous system or to our brain that something is not right for us. For Melzick and Wall, the big issue is something called substance P. This is a neurotransmitter that is involved in the transmission of these pain messages, of sending those um, neurological and neuron messages to the central nervous system, the peripheral, or to the brain um, that tells the gate in your spinal cord to open and send the message to the brain that something is either painful or that the message needs to be stopped. If you were to experience incredible levels of pain consistently over and over and over again, that would certainly not feel good. Um, so when we start to experience relief from a pain, for example, when we bang our elbow, many believe that it's that a message from substance P has sent the neural signal to the brain saying, hey, you can close that gate. The person doesn't need to feel pain anymore. They're already recognizing that something was not right, and now they're okay. So an example where we can see this breakdown where the brain and its various areas will um, detect pain messages, you can see that we have the pain sensory input established here. So the pain comes in to the thalamus, and the, thal the thalamus is our sensory relay station. It will relay it onto your somatosensory cortex and to areas of the limbic system. Where the somatosensory cortex is concerned, um, the sensory components of pain, so you know, knowing that something is you know, high in terms of the pain intensity um, or where the pain is located, that will go to the somatosensory cortex. Where the limbic system is concerned, the pain sensory information is going to um, provide us with that immediate experience of unpleasantness. Okay, so that discomfort, knowing, oh gosh, that really hurts, um, and a desire to uh, remove ourselves from the painful experience. And then this information is also going to get sent to the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is going to establish the secondary emotional and motivational component of pain. So this is the suffering itself. Um, oftentimes, our prefrontal cortex is going to register for us the extensive period of knowing how pain will affect us in the future, oftentimes that's a secondary response. 
Um, so, you know, knowing that you've broken your leg, first immediate responses are going to come from the somatosensory cortex and the limbic system to note this is incredibly painful and that something very bad in terms of this intensity of pain is, is ever present. Next, after that is kind of a secondary thought once the pain has, um, the intensity of that pain has subsided and we've gotten the leg checked out, for example, the prefrontal cortex is going to register for us that this is going to be painful for an extensive period, for weeks, possibly months, and, uh, and that is how gait control theory works. Pain control is a very interesting scenario because there are many out there that argue that pain is very much an issue of mind over matter, like we've discussed before. If you believe that you can control pain, it will happen. Drugs, for example, taking Advil, if you believe that Advil will help you with regard to your pain, uh, or Tylenol or Aleve, it will help you. Surgery, oftentimes, is a very interesting scenario because when you've been cut into, there are various different means that are attempted to help you control that pain. Some believe in acupuncture or exercise to help you address certain areas of pain, and those have proven to be um, beneficial. For example, exercise for those that have arthritis. The more that you stay active, the more that that is capable of warding off the discomfort of joint pain for those that have arthritis. You could also use hypnosis. You could put the person into a state of high suggestibility where you work with them to establish a uh, time frame to get them to recognize that pain doesn't need to be present any longer. One last thing to keep in mind with regard to pain, that's a pretty fascinating uh, account of just how your brain can work is the concept of phantom pain. This is when we feel pain in an area of our body that is no longer present. So for example, those that are amputees that have come home from war or that have been in car accidents and they've lost particular parts of their anatomy, they can still feel pain where that piece of body part was located. So this shows us that pain is not merely the result of physical stimulation in terms of touch or pressure um, or injury per se, purely because if you are missing a limb, there are no neural fibers there any longer for you to be able to experience the physical encompassment of pain. So phantom limb sensations seem to be due to your brain's kind of cross-wiring between the somatosensory cortex and nearby areas that were connected at one point to the phantom limb. So what occurs is stimulation of those parts cause sensation of that particular part of the person's anatomy that's no longer there. The missing limb is gone and yet it still experiences pain. Much of this is due, we, uh, we believe, to uh, memory. Um, if you think about it, memory, the temporal lobe, is located close to the somatosensory cortex. And so we believe that there might be some level of cross-wiring there where the brain is just operating purely based off of memory of the experience of the limb being there. And that's why it seems to cause the experience of phantom pain.